Well, good afternoon, and it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I, I am truly encouraged. Congratulations, Mark and Mark, on this excellent conference. I'm encouraged um, by the kind of conversation we're having. Um, and there's so much wisdom and grace and courage in the foreign policy scholars and practitioners who are here. And I hope that those of you who are students will consider joining the Guild. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a fine one and, and just really an honor to be in conversation with them. As Mark mentioned, I am actually in my day job in, in domestic policy. And so perhaps not properly in that Guild, but definitely a friend of it. And I did study uh, statecraft and world politics uh, at the Institute of World Politics. So um, good to be back with seeing many former colleagues and friends here and interacting with all of you. Uh, since I do deal in domestic policy, it may be a question, well, what, what's the relationship here? And well, I want to make that clear up front, that I have always thought that the character of our culture as the United States of America very much influences our capacity to lead on the world stage. Uh, that is a connection that is deeply important. A second aspect is that I am, as uh, someone who focuses on domestic policy, increasingly concerned, and have been over the last decade, about the ways in which international dynamics are increasingly influencing our ability as a domestic polity to direct the course of our, uh, our, our culture with regard to life and family and religious liberty and marriage and these kinds of issues. So my comments are going to focus on that kind of an interaction today. Now, uh, those of you who are students of foreign policy will know that for decades we have been having a debate in our foreign policy circles about uh, whether we should state the mission of foreign policy of the United States more in terms of our national interests or more in terms of spreading our ideals abroad. And I'm not going to speak to that today, just to acknowledge that it's there, and it's kind of an interminable perennial debate among schools of thought in the foreign policy circles. Uh, but one thing, wherever you come down on that, I think that we should all be clear on is that U.S. foreign policy exists to defend the United States of America. Now, that's obviously true, but it, it has a deeper meaning than we might obviously think about. We need a clearer idea of what the object of that protection is. What is the United States of America? What does it stand for? So I'd like to start with the, what I think is a pretty simple and straightforward idea, that there should be coherence between U.S. foreign policy and the principles and institutions and ideals of the constitutional order it exists to defend. And I'm particularly interested in pursuing that coherence around ideas concerning respect for life, for family, for civil society, and religious liberty. Now that coherence, I think, should be evident in our bilateral relations, including our general foreign policy, our public diplomacy, our foreign aid. It should be obvious in the extent to which we engage with multilateral organizations, the United Nations and its satellite organizations. Uh, and, and it should be evident in personnel matters. It ma personnel matters for the coherence of our uh, representation of what the United States is abroad. So let me go through each of those, and uh, then I'll be interested to interact with your questions. First, overall foreign policy and how we should see a coherence with respect to our domestic policy and our national character. Cold wars of ideas will be a constant reality in the national security and foreign policy strategic environment. And that means not only that policymakers must continually assess this strategic dimension, but also that our ideas about our own political order must be in good fighting shape, to quote one scholar of foreign policy writing in the middle of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Well, we need to reflect on whether our ideas are in good fighting shape, and I would argue that we have some work to do there. But an added challenge in the global battle of ideas for us as the United States is that in a free society, our general self-concept of our founding principles and institutions is more susceptible to erosion of purpose and meaning than under, that same understanding is in more authoritarian regimes. 
where such purpose and meaning is enforced by the regime. So America is a, a nation built on an idea, specifically that all men are created equal, that, we, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And Americans, um, America's founders designed a limited government and looked to family and churches and civil society, uh, mediating institutions, to promote the order and habits that would be necessary for a self-governing people. Now, in recent decades, we have seen the advance of political platforms that have succeeded in expanding our national government at the expense of that civil society, crowding out family, weakening our neighborhoods, marginalizing institutions of religion. This, in turn, contributes to a lack of shared understanding of the institutions and ideals that constitute our national character. So in particular, the role of religion and religious freedom in, America, in the American order is now very poorly understood. One reason for that is the idea of the strict separation of church and state that has become prevalent in the last half century. And this, of course, is an outlook that leads to the conclusion that government should have nothing to do with religion. It encourages the view that religion should be privatized, personal, not having to do with public policy or anything to do with international affairs for that matter. A second reason for the lack of policymakers' understanding about the significance of religion is the assumption that political and social prog progress will ultimately marginalize religion and, and we will progress beyond that and science and other uh, types of perfection will uh, negate the need for religion. Of course, the data does not show that, neither here and especially not abroad. The persistence of religion in human society is quite evident. So a lack of understanding of religion's continued relevance in our own constitutional order is very likely to create blinders about religion's significance abroad. If policymakers approach foreign affairs with a merely materialistic mindset and they're unfamiliar with a religious interpretive framework for human action and motivation, they're going to be ill-equipped to assess and to engage effectively with highly religious populations around the globe. Tom Farr mentioned the International Religious Freedom Act, which is approaching its 20th anniversary. And he well assessed the fact that we have a lack of progress on our hands. I would add and amplify a point he made that we have yet to see progress in that the, into the International Religious Freedom Office's assessments being brought into overall foreign policy analysis. And there's much more that could, could be done in that regard. Now, the nomination of Governor Sam Brownback as the ambassador at large for religious freedom is encouraging, for sure. And the proposed better alignment of personnel and resources under the ambassador at large, proposed by, uh, as a part of the State Department reorganization that's uh, on offer right now, these, these are promising developments as well. With new leadership, with new alignment, the office and the ambassador should be better integrated into the overall policy making functions of the State Department. Unfortunately, to date, the office has served mostly as a human rights monitoring agency. But U.S. foreign policy should rely more on the strategic insights that can be drawn from this office's assessment. So the work of the uh, International Religious Freedom Office should be better connected with foreign policy overall, and it should also be better connected with our efforts on public diplomacy. And let me turn to that at this point. U.S. public diplomacy aims to impart to foreign policy, to foreign audiences rather, an understanding and appreciation of American ideals, principles, institutions, and policy. This means that U.S. public diplomacy must be firmly grounded in those principles and ideals, including concerning religion. The American model of religious liberty and its continued, the continued significance of religious practice in our communities these are defining attributes of the United States. These features characterize the, uh, America as much as our market economy and our democratic political system, as the late Michael Novak taught us often. Religion has greatly influenced US history, from the earliest settlements to the great social justice movements of the 19th century and the 20th century. Today, even the vast majority of Americans would say that religion is at least somewhat important to them 
And we see faith-based organizations very active in helping those in need. That's been very evident in the wake of the hurricanes that have afflicted the Gulf this year. So religious liberty is an American success story, and the vibrancy of religious practice here in the United States is a success story that should be told around the world. And one of the major reasons for the success of the American experiment is that it allowed citizens to be able to uh, reconcile their allegiance to the state with their allegiance to their ultimate allegiance to God without forcing them to abandon that ultimate allegiance or to moderate it. This habit of reconciling civil and religious authorities, as well as the process of harmonizing interests of competing religious groups, has helped to fortify the discipline of self-government here in the United States. And meanwhile, the moral authority exercised by religious congregations, by families, other private associations, helps to maintain limited government. The American founders were frequently stating how virtue and religion are essential to maintaining this freedom in society. These are the moral conditions of freedom, you might say. So what does this mean for public diplomacy? Well, it means that the message itself is even more important than the modes and techniques for communicating that message around the world. In this 21st century war of ideas, it's critical that US public diplomacy rely on the bedrock of America's founding principles. So pop culture, on which public diplomacy in past years has been too often tempted to rely, cannot do justice to American ideals in the fight against potent ideologies that present strong, coherent, and deeply misguided explanations of the nature and purpose of human existence. We are in a very grave battle of ideas, and we need to take it seriously. In other words, this war of ideas calls for stronger substance than, say, Coca-Cola and Lady Gaga. It requires clear, compelling, coherent articulation of the principles and institutions that define the American order. This is most especially true when we are engaging through our public diplomacy populations who are themselves deeply religious. U.S. public diplomacy must convey to majority religious communities that adopting a policy of religious freedom can be consistent with promoting a positive and a public role for religion. The U.S. model of religious liberty has always taken a favorable view of religious practice both in private and in public. Far from privatizing and marginalizing religion, it assumes that religious believers and institutions will take active roles in society, including engaging in the political process and in the formulation of public moral consensus. Now these are things that we're seeing erosion in uh, when it concerns our domestic policy. Tom Farr ended on that important note. He says, these are things I'm working on every day at the Heritage Foundation. But the fact is that the historic and founding uh, interpretation of religious freedom was one that was freedom for religion, and we should be con continue to be clear about that today. So US public diplomacy should communicate the continued importance of religious liberty, religious practice, and traditional values in American society. Most Americans continue to, atta to attach a great significance to religious faith. And, and want to practice their religion, want to uh, value marriage and family and, and the ability to raise their children in a morally supportive environment. And those are the kind of values that will connect with deeply religious societies abroad. This is a bridge that we need to be uh, using and exploring more in our public diplomacy. Turning now to foreign aid, uh, I want to look at a specific example of how the United States in its public assistance should be uh, doing, uh, offering aid consistent with our respect for life. We've had a long-standing consensus here in the United States that we will not use taxpayer dollars for the promotion of abortion, for funding abortion. And that extends to the idea of US tax dollars not being used to subsidize abortion abroad. Uh, 80% of Americans, upwards of 80% of Americans, do not think that American taxpayer dollars should be used to support a, a, a abortion abroad. And the Mexico City policy has reflected this perspective of the American people in the area of foreign assistance. 
the policy was first enacted by President Reagan in 1984, and it's been upheld by every Republican president since then and not upheld by every Democratic president since then. President Trump, uh, true to that pattern, has reinstated the policy, and it has to date required foreign NGOs to certify that they will not perform abortions and that they will not actively promote abortion as a method of family planning in the use, if they are recipients of USAID or State Department uh, family planning funds. President Trump has gone further to expand that policy so that it now applies to funds from all agencies and departments. And the expanded policy now applies to more than nine billion, almost $9 billion uh, across uh, the government. So this is making sure that U.S. funds do not subsidize abortion or advocacy of ab abortion abroad. It makes sure that the U.S. government is supporting global health while also affirming life, which is consistent with the goal of health around the world. Let me turn uh, finally to multilateral institutions and then on to personnel. All eyes, of course, were on the United Nations last week as the North Korea crisis uh, and the tension surrounding it played out on that stage. And clashes such as this over uh, international security and stability are fairly, uh, we, we are uh, used to them happening and our, our, gaze, our, our attention being turned to the United Nations for that kind of thing on the international security front. What doesn't get much attention, however, is the constant current of liberal social policy making that is springing from the UN system. This, is, this was particularly true during the Obama administration as it was during the Clinton administration. Uh, during these administrations, the US supported policy on social issues that pressed a liberal social ideology on more conservative countries around the world, particularly the developing world. Well, under the new administration and with U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley in New York, the U.S. has an important opportunity to provide much needed leadership for policies that respect life and family and religious liberty there. To do that effectively, it's important, obviously, that the United States stand for the right policies at the U.N. But it's also important that U.S. leaders press for reforms to the U.N. bureaucracy because that is the source of this pressure to liberalize social policy around the globe. One of the biggest problems in, in this regard is the UN's system of treaty monitoring bodies. These are charged with monitoring the implementation of the conventions and the treaties that the UN um, passes and that, states, that, that nation states uh, participate in and sign on to. And these committees use their implementing authority to issue comments on uh, areas of some, uh, that need some clarification within the treaties. But rather than necessarily constraining themselves to technical, uh, technical uh, clarification, the treaty bodies will often go well beyond that and stretch the, the, uh, the policy beyond the scope of the actual treaty language. So to give you one example of this, a 2016 comment from the committee that monitors compliance with the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the, the, the comment from this committee interpreted language in that covenant stating there is a right to sexual and reproductive health. That was the actual language in the covenant. The committee interpreted that to include a right to abortion, even though that's nowhere mentioned in the text of the covenant. Uh, and the committee, of course, then uses this to pressure states that have signed on to that to adopt such policies in their domestic policy. Um, we could talk about a similar uh, case involving the Human Rights Committee. Uh, it's charged with monitoring compliance to the International Covenant on Civil, Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR. Uh, this explicitly states, every human being has inherent right to life. This right shall be protected by law. And yet, the Human Rights Committee is asserting that there's a right to abortion embedded here and has criticized uh, the, United, the United States. The UN officials have been criticizing the United States because we have at our state level many states who have passed pro-life laws. There are pro-life laws at the federal level as well, and we're getting criticism from UN bodies because of that. Well, um, this is, it's worth recalling at this point that the U.S. is the largest financial contributor to the United Nations. Um, so the U.S. has every reason to be a strong voice for protection of life and family and religious liberty in this venue. We need to be steering that the United Nations back to 
the core of what human rights enumerated clearly in agreed upon documents has been articulated and not stretching to liberal social policy. Well, there's a saying that dates back to the Reagan administration that per personnel is policy. If you want to accomplish a mission, it's imperative to have people that believe in that mission and who have the ability to accomplish it. And that's especially true in the diffuse world of foreign policy, beginning with the vast bureaucracy here in, in Washington, extending to the UN and its satellite organizations, and of course, around the world to uh, embassies and to all kinds of programs that are funded by the federal government. And the policies I've talked about here today obviously have important personnel implications attached to them. Most obviously, it matters quite a bit who's appointed at the State Department. That's one reason for great encouragement about the nomination of Governor Sam Brownback to lead the Religious Freedom Office. Leaders in other posts at the State Department need to be officials who will respect life and family and religious liberty and the role of civil society. Second area of personnel that we need to concentrate on in, in light of these issues is Foreign Service Officer training. Foreign Service Officers should have training to be able to effectively represent the constitutional order they are pledged to defend. And yet, we don't, I, uh, Tom Farr is an expert in this, and others in the room may have insights on it uh, directly. We need to be doing more in this regard, and especially as it pertains to religion and religious liberty. One of the particular ideas that Tom uh, proposed several years ago was the idea of a subspecialty career track in the Foreign Service that would allow for career advancement and, and specialization in religious liberty so that we would have throughout the Foreign Service uh, expertise on religion, religious liberty, and a deep understanding of its place in the American order. A third area for personnel concerns is the staffing at the United Nations, in Geneva, and as we uh, participate in international organizations there. The post in Geneva is yet to be filled. There's an, uh, an, a holdover from the last administration. So this is a critical post for def defending the kinds of policy issue areas I've been talking about today. A fourth area is appointing delegations to sessions, special sessions of the UN. So for instance, every March, the Commission on the Status of Women, Wendy Wright knows this well, goes on and it is, uh, there are many, many liberal NGOs with ideas about uh, abortion and other radical social policy. It is important that the U.S. send delegations there who are ready to stand up for the principles that we hold dear and that are consistent with United States policy and able to defend that in that kind of uh, a controversial venue. Finally, I want to end on this note. Given our focus here today, I think it's imperative that we have people uh, who are able to understand the significance of religion, understand the nature of religion and its practice, uh, have respect for life, family, civil society, and religious liberty. We need more people like this going into the ranks of our foreign service and international relations. Um, I hope that means many of you, uh, but we, this is a calling that's critically important, and the future of uh, stability and security in the world is related to it, and as well, our stability and security and our domestic order depends on it greatly as well. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you. I'll be happy to answer questions. I think. Another Way in the back. Hi, I'm Miranda again. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't know if I necessarily have a question, but I just wanted to um, tell you that I really appreciate what you said about um, our perspectives as Americans on religious freedom and, um, you know, the family unit, et cetera, and how that influences us when we are perceived by other countries. Um, I have never thought about that before. Mm. I guess because I just get so caught up in what America's doing. And I think about, like, when I think about foreign policy, I immediately think about war and terrorism. And so I've never um, considered that the role that we play, just as an example, as America, and how we deal with those particular things um, 
just sets precedent with other countries. So thank you for pointing that out. I can't believe I've never thought like that before. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for I your appreciate comment. that. That's great. And and think about the if we if we do not think about this in a concerted way, um, the the impressions of America that go global without us doing anything are driven by Hollywood, driven by commercial enterprises and so on. Um, those are, at, at best, mixed messages, right? And, and we would find some things lacking in some representations of American society. Hi, Ted Mormon. I've heard in some instances, in some countries, it's often multinational corporations that tend to be a larger representation of our government and our society than uh, state representation. And I'm just curious uh, what you would say to that in terms of our policy and kind of, uh, you know, representing America well through corporations involved in uh, international enterprise. Right. Um, I can't speak to that empirically. I don't have evidence one way or the other to the claim. But um, just watching how uh, corporations have gotten more involved in our domestic policy debates in recent years, um, uh, corporations have come out against religious freedom uh, uh, policies uh, in Arizona and in Indiana and in North Carolina. You've heard about some of these controversies, no doubt. Um, I would not doubt that there are probably some uh, some dynamics uh, that happen around the world in, in some of the same directions. Um, what I think that says is that there must be a proactive effort on the part of leaders in public diplomacy and other uh, elements of statecraft to think deliberately about using those tools uh, to communicate a uh, m perhaps a more um, full and grounded view of the American order. Um, we have to think deliberately about that. This is, does not happen automatically. <clears throat> and in a, in, the, in a social media driven world, in a globalized um, communications world, uh, messages move much faster. And our, I, don't, I don't think that our public diplomacy and information uh, efforts have kept up with that. So it's, it's got to be a deliberate strategy. And um, I, I don't think we're keeping up with that. Yeah. I'm going to ask a, a slight segue question that I've been trying to find an avenue to do. So this is going to work. Um, you talked about military personnel. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've loved your material in the past. She's written for Providence. You should check out that issue on assigning women into direct ground combat roles in the U.S. military. Um, how does that affect a conversation about how Christians might think about national security, mm -hmm. uh, military or personnel issues, things like this? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So my closing thoughts on personnel um, were very much, this is in keeping with that, that military personnel decisions matter too. And the recent decision to open all combat roles to women has very significant uh, consequences and, and repercussions for society that we may not be thinking through as much as we should. In the article that Mark's referring to, I referred to it as perhaps not breaking a glass ceiling but more like moving a load-bearing wall of society. And have we counted the costs of that? So for instance, one thing that particularly concerns me is that there was a case in 1981 that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme, as, and it was uh, uh, over the issue of male-only selective service registration. The, and the, uh, uh, the desire of the plaintiff was to have everyone register, men and women. The court uh, did not do that and, and kept male-only selective service registration because it said it deferred to the fact that Congress had uh, combat, had defined combat roles as only open to males. So the draft policy was consistent with the combat uh, policy. The change in that, therefore, removes the, the core argument that the court respected for not opening up draft registration to women. So these are the kinds of cultural consequences that I do not think we've had an adequate debate about in the United States, that opening uh, the policy change to open all combat roles to women uh, may lead to uh, court challenges that uh, seek for uh, registration for the draft of all, including women. So, that, the reason I think it fits in the stream of thought that I was trying to spell out here today is that we need to be careful about the kinds of decisions that are made in foreign policy and national security circles 
um, such as empowering the United Nations to do certain things, because that has a feedback loop that then comes to affect our domestic freedom to make our own social policy. Uh, similarly, this opening of combat rules may have a feedback loop that the consequences go much further than the original intention was. So we need to be aware of those replications and, and uh, repercussions and have a better conversation between domestic social policy experts and foreign policy experts to make sure we're thinking about those consequences. I think Faith, I back there, and then over here. Donald, thank you, Jennifer. This was great. Um, I helped work on the IRFA, International Religious Freedom Act, way back when. And um, talking about personnel, um, one of the greatest horror stories of that time, and Shajan, you'll love this too, was that there were, we were talking about the need for foreign, um, foreign policy people, foreign service people, to be trained in the culture of Christians in other countries. And the nominee to be the ambassador to China had never heard of a house church before. So um, in terms of that, what you were saying about uh, helping them to um, be educated in constitutional rights of our own country, um, have you talked to any of your other colleagues who work on domestic religious liberty constitutional issues mm -hmm. about the need for like some kind of task force to push for change in the Foreign Service? <laughs> um, the great suggestion, and I think the time is ripe right now with the uh, State Department reorganization. It's an uh, opportunity for us to have um, to bring this perspective to the table. Um, I do think, too, that we need to be thinking about better overall education uh, across the federal government about the, the order, the constitutional order that uh, public servants are uh, pledged to defend and to serve. And so, yeah, point taken, very, very good recommendation. And uh, it is uh, sporadic and needs to be more systematic. So I'll take that as an action item. Thank you. Now back here. Bruce Carson from Regent University at Robson School of Government. Um, quick questions or comment, both in reference to religious freedom and uh, more so how the United States is viewed in foreign countries. And I want to reference Saudi Arabia in the mm -hmm. 90s when we sent uh, females over there to help train their military. Mm -hmm. How to us, you know, we're, we're helping them, we're, we're showing them modernity, women can do these roles, mm -hmm. but it kind of, you know, backlash on us, like, hey, they're, they're tearing up our country, they're spreading the secularism throughout our country, and now we need to get the United States and or the West in general, you know, out of, um, I guess, Islamic culture and life because they're deteriorating. So how do we resolve that conflict, or is it by nature circular? Uh, say that last, what do you mean by circular there? Circular, in, in that, um, hey, we want to spread religious freedom, mm -hmm. we want to show equality between men and women, mm -hmm. so going to go attempt to show this face to the rest of the world. However, when we come back, hey, we really don't want that type of freedom that you're offering as far as religious freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. And you point me in the right direction, if not. Um, I, I think that Number one, I think these are much better when we can pursue these in ways that incorporate all our bilateral tools of statecraft and uh, not having to filter um, through the UN, which is trying to do more often than these basic fundamental human rights. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that's been ironic to me is the degree to which you've heard um, elite academic circles talk about cultural sensitivity, and yet liberal foreign policy, I would say, does not represent that very frequently um, and does not take into account often uh, the values of the uh, audience to which it's trying to communicate or engage. Um, so I think, uh, again, these are matters of deep prudence to make uh, judgments about how to advance basic human rights like religious freedom abroad, um, how, how to um, you know, ha have the equal treatment of all citizens. That's very important. So it's going to, I, this I would, I guess, come back to my last point, which personnel really matters to be able to make those very um, complex uh, strategic uh, decisions and the implementation of them and um, seeking the wisdom of you know other uh, other players in this I didn't talk about track two diplomacy but the idea the idea of religious NGOs engaging 
uh, peers abroad is sometimes an interesting way to open up um, dialogue. And I'm, there are people in the room who have invested time in, in similar things, even in the Middle East. So um, there are many more tools. It takes wise and prudent leadership to uh, put that together into something that will advance uh, the right things and, and make forward, uh, forward progress uh, without the kind of backlash that would set it off course. Next, you. Hi, uh, Stephen Lane, um, Florida State University, PhD student in uh, religious ethics. Great. Um, one of the concerns I guess I have with this idea of linking domestic policy and foreign policy, mm -hmm. um, one of the first things that we're taught in, in our program is that nothing is a monolith. And I feel like we have a tendency to mm, sort of create a monolith of American culture. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm worried about how we can have a coherent foreign policy when we don't have a coherent uh, or unified mm -hmm. domestic culture, mm -hmm. um, right? Your point that Hollywood sends messages that mm -hmm. commercial organizations send messages that might be different from what a lot of people in this room would think is the American message. Mm -hmm. To me, in the way I view any sort of tradition like that, is that they're both part of the mm -hmm. same tradition, and there's a there's a conflict going on. So, can we have foreign policy be coherent until or before we have our cultural wars figured out? Mm -hmm. Good. That's, that's an excellent question, and perhaps the crux of the matter for the subject that I'm talking about here. Um, I think we need to divide between the discrete policy applications of differing worldviews, which we see, you know, these are the kinds of things debated in Congress, on the nightly news, and I think that's the kinds of things you're referencing. I want to distinguish between those things which were, are at the moment endlessly divisive, I agree with you on that, and the kinds of core founding understanding of our American order. And I do think that we need to come to some common understanding of that. And we haven't given enough attention to that. So I, that's the level that I'm trying to get at, the DNA of our constitutional order um, that I think we, we need to have a lot more uh, consensus perspective about. And, and I think you're, we could also apply your observation to say we don't have an adequate consensus about it. Um, but I think we uh, should be pursuing that and seek that is the constitutional order uh, that foreign policy needs to represent. Foreign policy is not just defending a land mass. It is defending ideals and institutions and concepts and principles. And we need to have a clear idea of what those founding ideas are. Yeah, in the middle. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Marshall, uh, for the comprehensive and precise uh, presentation. My name is Agnes Oswaha. I'm from South Sudan. Uh, so I would like to follow up on the unified uh, domestic culture, uh, taking it from an immigrant and refugee perspective. So when a refugee family, for example, is being resettled in the US, and they are faced with a domestic affair issue, uh, usually is being approached from a lit litigative uh, manner, which ends up into the breaking up of the family and children becoming victims, and the two couples, uh, who knows what will happen mm -hmm. to them if they are not strong. And uh, usually, uh, when you look into the immigrant uh, family, for example, uh, our children from South Sudan, we have a high number that are now like in gang, grouping, mm. uh, hopelessness, and uh, uh, a number is also rising that they are being put under deportation proceeding. So you're deporting people uh, that are a uh, creation of your product. Uh, to South Sudan, who, who did not uh, participate in raising those children in the way of this Hollywood culture. Uh, when we go back to the core of the family, uh, the Bible or the Holy Bible is all about the family. If we get the essence of family wrong, then uh, we'll be wondering 
what kind of uh, Jesus like we are trying to live. So what I'm trying to say is there is a need uh, for religious leaders to intervene and to assist for as uh, much as directly with these refugee families, especially if they are Christians, if there is an issue, I would prefer a church to provide counseling rather than running to court. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, for example, in South Sudan or in other places around the world, if there is an issue within the family, the elders within the family would be the one to settle the issue, or the elders within the community, which the refugee and immigrants family lack most of the time when they get resettled. Then I'm also happy uh, with the uh, uh, removal of the legalization of abortion uh, tied into the NGOs aspect in terms of funding, because for us in South Sudan, uh, we have this constant struggle with the international partners uh, in regards to family planning. We are only a nation of 12 million, most of the people are still in diaspora, haven't returned home. And here you are talking to me about abortion, family planning, and all kinds of things. That, not, that, that is, again, is my cultural values. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, it's very helpful. Um, with regard to your comments on immigration, I think, number one, uh, there, it's obvious that our country is in dire need of immigration reform, and um, that is uh, a challenging issue. But I think your comment speaks as well to the issue of how well we are helping immigrants become a part, refugees and immigrants become a part of American life. And churches are enormously important. You are absolutely right. And we need to be thinking about that more, about helping people through the transition of uh, finding their way in a confusing culture. And we do no service. The same kinds of uh, crisis of confidence of what our constitutional order is that I was talking about with regard to foreign policy is also um, uh, impairing our ability to help refugees and immigrants become a part of American life um, without feeling like they risk their children's future because of the cultural forces that may be around them. Churches can be helpful in navigating that, and we need to reflect on that a whole lot more. So thank you for that.